Karen. Yes. How badly would you want to learn how to unlock the secrets of personal and planetary evolution? Ooh, I want to know what that is first. <laughs> <laughs> planetary evolution. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Well, then how about gaining a deeper understanding of our divine potential? Well, that I would like. So I guess that then exploring the concepts of conscious life creation, ascension, and embodying our divine selves might hold a certain attraction to you, too. Absolutely. Okay, well, then in today's episode, we're going to dive into all of these and so many more topics, all surrounding a very personal story of a near-death experience that completely revolutionized our guest's approach to life, medicine, and peace of mind. And she's sharing the secrets she learned during her time on the other side, and if you want to learn them too, then this is an episode for you. Welcome to The Skeptic Metaphysicians. My name is Will. And I'm Karen. And unlike Mulder and Scully, we both want to believe. So we've embarked on a journey of discovery. We've talked to people deeply entrenched in the spiritual and metaphysical world. We've thrown ourselves into weird and wonderful experiences. I even joined a coven of witches. And, wait, you joined a coven? Yep, all in the interest of finding something. Anything. That will prove that there's something beyond this physical. Three-dimensional world we all live in. This is The The Skeptic Skeptic Metaphysicians. Metaphysicians. Welcome back to another episode of The Skeptic Metaphysicians. I'm Will. And I'm Karen. And today, we have a truly remarkable guest who's touched the lives of thousands around the globe. Joining us today is Alyssa Rushton, a death survivor, internationally known energy intuitive and sound healer. Now, Alyssa is recognized as one of the world's most cutting-edge thought leaders on conscious life creation, ascension, and, like I said earlier, embodying your divine self. Now, her breakthrough work for personal and planetary evolution, see where I did there, can be found in her recorded programs such as Reality by Divine Design and the Miracles and Manifesting Portal, as well as in her contributions to various online summits. Alyssa has inspired countless life leaders, students, clients, and listeners to step into their true identity as divine beings and activate their inner superpower. I could not be more excited to welcome Alyssa Rushton to the show. Alyssa, thanks for coming on. Oh my gosh, I am so excited to be here with you guys today. This is going to be so yummy. Oh my gosh, and how? I'm overwhelmed just by the introduction. (laughs) Wow, that's a lot. (laughs) We're we're thrilled to have you on here. And the obvious question, right, because everything that we're going to talk about today revolves around one particular event, and that is your near-death experience. Can you share with us How you like what happened? You died and came back. Okay, so yes, I did die. I did come back. And uh, it really depends on how much of the story you want to know. I guess where I'll start is that I was critically ill. I had a whole list of diseases. And you can think things like MS, rheumatoid arthritis. um, You know, I had celiac, all of these autoimmune types of diseases, and I was on 28 different medications. I had a pick line in my arm, which is where they basically install a plastic tube that goes into your heart and they um, infuse you with medications all day. And I was doing that. And I was also on end of life medication um, for pain management. And it's the kind of stuff that they give you when they know you're going to die. Because A, it can kill you, and uh, B, if you do live, you don't really stand a chance of getting off of the medication. Good Lord. Wow. That sounds awful. Yeah, it was pretty bad. Is it? I mean, hmm. You're so perky. Uh, I, yeah. <laughs> like I'm having a disconnect here. <laughs> I know. To look at you, to listen to you, you do not you do not seem like someone who's sick at all. So how did you, I mean, are you completely no longer have the thing in your arm, I see, but how... How did you get better? Well, I think that for me was a was an aspect that happened, you know, when I died, I got a big reboot. And, um, you know, you also have to remember, if you look at me right now, back then, by the way, I was 30 when I died. I was 240 pounds. I wore diapers because I couldn't, you know, had lost bodily functions as we know of them as adults. And I uh, used a walker to get it around when I did get around. So, yeah, it was it was really bad. And to answer your question, when I died, which I'll talk about in a minute, you you basically get a big reboot when you die. And and my point, by the way, 
for everybody who needs a big reboot is you don't have to wait until you die to get the reboot. Um, well, that's good news. Yeah. Spoiler alert. <laughs> don't wait. <laughs> you can reboot yourself before then, okay? So spoiler yeah. alert. Don't wait. Don't yeah. wait. Well, I'm hoping that's why people are listening in now because they don't want to die before they can change their life. And uh, learning from people like you that have gone through it and come back and, hey, this is how to do it. I'm hoping to learn from it. So how did you die? Let's base it there first. What happened that flatlined you? Yeah. So if you can imagine all of that drug cocktail on a daily basis was enough to have me riding the line between life and death most days. And so on this fateful day, I had a little too much of many medications and I came home because I would infuse at the doctor's office every day and I came home and I wasn't feeling very well. And, you know, they had me on um, these um, these suckers, these fentanyl suckers. And you've probably seen signage all over town like, don't do fentanyl. It can kill you on your first time. Well, you have to remember, I was doing fentanyl suckers multiple times a day. And this is the stuff where the caregivers in my house would, there would be signs up saying, don't even touch this stuff if there's a sucker laying around because it can kill you. So basically, it was a huge drug cocktail that I was on. And I got up in the middle of the night. I wasn't feeling good. I was kind of struggling already. I go to the bathroom because what do you do when you're not feeling good? You go to the bathroom. Um, By the way, Mm -hmm. if you are going to die, I highly recommend do it on the toilet. It's the perfect spot. (laughs) I'll just sit out, you know. I don't know, man. Note to self. Being found on the toilet doesn't sound like a fun thing for me. Well, if you're dead. Well, but yeah. But then you might come back and then then you're embarrassed. (laughs) It's also embarrassing when you come back. Yeah, it's a little. Yeah. (laughs) There is that. There is that. So, yeah. So I went to the bathroom and I, you know, I was just not feeling well and So I died on the potty. And the cool part about where my bathroom was, was that, you know, the toilet's here and then there was a wall right next to the toilet. So I I had slumped over. Otherwise, I would have fallen off the toilet. But I stayed upright, which was which was kind of cool. Didn't break anything. And, um, you know, I'm going to leave the down to earth stuff. I'm going to set that aside for a minute. So back on Earth, I'm dead. And meanwhile, me, my spirit, my essence goes up, 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 up. And here's the thing. I didn't have the experience that many people have, which is seeing the pearly gates or all of that. My So no did you get a tunnel and people at the at the end of the tunnel? No, that kind of thing? Got no people, no. none of that stuff. But I will tell you what I what I think happens based on my experience over there is I think that you get a customized death experience for whatever your beliefs are. So Uh it's going to feel wonderful for you based on what you believe. So if you believe in heaven, then you're going to get the heaven experience. If you believe in um, Shiva or Buddha, you're going to get that experience. If you believe in your family comes to grace you, you're going to get the family experience. I didn't believe in any of that. So I didn't get any of that, really. I went up directly into what I call God consciousness. And I got to tell you, the first thing is it was the most loving, blissful, delicious experience without a body. Like I had no body on the other side. And I remember looking down and realizing I don't have a body. So then what was it? Was it just energy? Did you look down and there was an arm there? No arm there? It was just kind of nothing? No arms, but I had the distinct feeling of feeling very physical and stretchy with energy. So if you can imagine no body, but like a light situation, but a physical situation. So I'm coming up, up, up. I'm getting soaked up into this God consciousness or universal consciousness or divine consciousness. And... It was such a feeling of bliss and love and joy and pain-free. Like I was pain-free completely for the first time in years. And it was so, Mm -hmm. it was so physical, but no body and sensational and just every part of me felt alive and expanded. And so the best way I can describe what I saw up there is, have you ever seen a movie where you've got the security guy and he's sitting in front of like hundreds of different security cameras? Yes. Mm -hmm. So 
I want you to imagine that only on the billions level. So it was little kind of circular visuals of billions and billions and billions of experiences that I then, the consciousness, could move into and experience. And I'm using my hands because it was such a physical, it felt like elastic consciousness. Or do you remember that doll, Stretch Armstrong? Did you have a Stretch oh, Armstrong? Oh, yes. Do we ever? <laughs> <laughs> right? It felt yeah. like Stretch Armstrong. I mean, it just felt like the stretchy, amazing and I could go into all these billions of experiences and I could be a rock and I could see and feel what the rock was experiencing. And I could be the plants and I could be other planets and I could be other life forms and I could be all of that all at once and literally getting billions and billions of data points all at once. So it was a little, I mean, to, to bring it back into the mind, it's very overwhelming. It was an overwhelmingly amazing experience. But right. that's where it started. And then as I started to explore and journey and go into all of these places, you know, some of the worlds and planets were not like anything that we have. They were indescribable with different beings. And when I say indescribable, we don't really have like there's not a word for certain beings like light body is the best I could describe it because there are different colors and beings, but they're but they're um, like a human type of, not an animal, okay, but not a human. So a higher advanced mm -hmm. consciousness, not that animals aren't, but do you know what I'm saying? Like weird stuff yeah. that sure. you can't really describe all that well. So I'm seeing all of this. And then at the same time, I'm seeing how everything gets projected out of our universe. So I saw light and then sound and sacred geometry starting to form and like forming all of these things for our known physical universe that we're on. So I started to get a lot of downloads about math and how things work and how we can heal our bodies and how maybe the stories that we were told on planet Earth aren't necessarily all the way true or maybe are far apart and that there's... um there's many, 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 many different timelines. We tend to think about our experience as one solid experience. Mm -hmm. But what I was seeing up there was multiplicities of the earth experience. So it was a very complex thing. It was involved. I got to see a lot of different places and spaces and expand and grow and learn. And then at one point, I remember seeing this orb that I thought, ooh, I want to go and really check that out. And so, mind you, all this time, I'm feeling not Alyssa-based. I'm feeling God consciousness-based. I'm feeling one with everything. I'm feeling, you know, one with the cosmos and all that is. And as soon as I saw this orb, it looked very much like Earth. So I go down and I pull my consciousness into this Earth. And it looked very much like our earth here, except the sky and everything was sort of olive drabby tinge to it, like an army green. And huh. I immediately was like, oh, I'm going to go check out my old ex-boyfriend, my very first ex-boyfriend ever. So I go and I, and I think of him and instantly I'm at his condo and I can see that he can't see me. I can see that uh, there's no interacting with him. But it felt very nourishing to me. I felt like, okay, this is going to be a nice healing place for me. And I was kind of hanging around him. And he had some addictions. And I felt like, oh, this is, this is good. And then I went and saw a couple more people. And then at some point, I, and I realized, I'm thinking, this is weird. Like, I can feel like I'm Alyssa. But I, I'm thinking, I wonder why I can't talk to anybody. I'm not exactly sure where I am. And then a group consciousness comes and says, you know, you can stay here as long as you want. It's going to be a very healing place for you, but you cannot come back into your Alyssa body. But if you'd like to come back, it'll be some of the hardest work you've ever done, but it'll be very worth it. And in that moment, I just thought, yes, I want to come back. And as soon as I thought, yes, I got slammed back into my body. It was like someone dropped me off a thousand foot building and I was waking up to, you know, the compression of my chest and <laughs> gasps for air. And that's when I was back in my bathroom 
you know, coming wow. and gasping for air, seeing the EMTs all around me, thinking, wow, you know, what's so, what's going on? So in, in our time, not not a lot of time had gone by. Yeah, um, it could have been as much as 20 minutes. It could have been 10 minutes. Um, but not mm. what the eons it felt like in eternity right. over there. Yeah. So when when you were there, sorry, Karen, I'll give I'll give you a, a chance just one second because I'm dying to ask mm-hmm. this question. When you were there and you were mm-hmm. going and mm-hmm. visit, seeing your ex boyfriend and things like that, did it feel real or did it feel like a dream? Did you feel like you were just kind of imagining it? How was that experience? Yeah, that part. I mean, all of it felt very real. And I, in fact, didn't learn what that was until years later. I was reading a book by Savannah Arienta called Frequency, and she's describing the place where I was to the T. And she described the experience and the olive green, the olive drab color. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I can't believe she's just written about my experience. And what she said was it's basically the etheric layer of the planet where stuck souls go, uh, particularly mm-hmm. ones that die. They don't move on. Um, they die from suicide, drug overdose, or trauma where they don't move fully into the light and go forward. They basically get stuck in the etheric <laughs> layer. So I was going to basically be stuck in the oh, etheric wow. layer. Yeah. Wow. So when you first started telling us about this, you shoot out and you're in this place looking at all these screen, so to say, of all these different experiences, were you alone or did you feel like you were alone? Because it, I'm just getting this image of like someone sitting by themselves in a movie theater, like looking at all of this stuff. Great question. Did it, how did it feel? So think less me, Alyssa, being alone and think more uh, me, Alyssa, as God consciousness as everything, all of it is. So I had no identity up there. I was one with source energy. I was one with everything. I was one with all creation. It was the most amazing feeling of oneness and being held and being loved and being loved that is a mat. I mean, you can't even have describe it. It was just so yeah. potent and amazing. But it wasn't I I Alyssa consciousness. I didn't feel mm-hmm. like Alyssa consciousness. I felt like all that is. And when you went into the different, like into the rock or into the different experiences, how was that? Did that you still feel that huge, like all is one consciousness in those experiences? Like everybody, all of source, everything was having those experiences along with you? Yeah. Well, so I didn't feel separated from them. It wasn't like these things outside of me are having these experiences along with me. It felt like pieces mm-hmm. of me, extenuated pieces of one consciousness looping a feedback loop informing the source energy. You said a couple of times that you felt this is me, Alyssa, but I wasn't Alyssa in terms of consciousness. So even though you were feeling you were part of the collective consciousness, for lack of a better word, mm-hmm. you also seemed to identify yourself as Alyssa at the time. No, not not over there. I did no. In the etheric layer, I for sure I felt like I'm Alyssa. I felt like I could feel my Alyssa-ness, but over there, uh, I was one with everything. Gotcha. Does that make gotcha. sense? Yep, yeah. Two different mm-hmm. places. Yep. Two different was, places. I and I really did together. have two different distinct experiences in these two places. And it's funny, Karen, to your question, like with all those other individuated aspects, I really felt as if they were all a part of one ray of light, one ray of consciousness, but each one of them was individuated and informing and growing the consciousness, which is kind of my theory on life, which, you know, all of our experiences now are just simply to inform and expand the consciousness. And there's not really a good or bad or a right or wrong. We're all just informing back into the consciousness. But yeah, oh, on, on that leg of the journey, it was literally like I lost my identity as the personality Alyssa. But in the etheric layer, I was totally the personality Alyssa. I was totally, you know, uh, wanting to feed addiction still. Because when I died, I was a drinker. I was a smoker. I was a total prescription drug addict. I mean, you know, just really a food addict. I was all of those things. So I wanted to go hang around people that had addictions so that I could feed off of those addictions. And by the way, I think that's also why people that have addictions, sometimes those addictions can get worse because on the other side, 
there are energies that feed into those um, addictions and kind of amplify it for a person, if that makes any sense. Before you died, did you have a certain belief system? Is this, did you believe in anything? Because you mentioned earlier on that whatever you believed is what happened on the other side. So did you have that belief system that you would become one with all consciousness or is this a surprise to you? Yeah, well, you know, I I was confused a little bit in my beliefs. I grew up in a very Christian home and we did mission trips and we would go to foreign countries and, you know, pass out the Bible and convert people. And I remember when we were in Thailand and I asked the pastor we were with, I said, hey, well, uh, do you mean to tell me that all these people that that have been here in Thailand that didn't know about Jesus Christ are going to go, you know, down place? <laughs> <laughs> that place which we shall not name right exactly <laughs> and he's like yes that's exactly what i mean mm-hmm. and i just i mean you guys in thailand especially these people that i met there were the most generous giving joyful glowy lit up the heart you could feel their heart from a mile away and i just thought this is ridiculous i can't believe in a religion that tells me these people are going to go to their Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I can't believe in that. So that kind of broke my uh, religion construct. And then after that, in my 20s, I started dabbling in Reiki. And of course, I read, you know, um, James Redfield's Celestine Prophecy. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, I mm-hmm. And so I started to dabble, but I wasn't really sure what happened on the other side. I knew for sure it wasn't heaven. Like I knew for sure I didn't identify at all with the pearly gates and that story. Um, But I did identify with the cosmos. So I feel like of my experience, it really fit in well. But it was surprising even for me, like all the stuff that I saw in the sacred geometry and all that I learned about sound and how that works and was able to bring that back down here. That stuff was surprising to me. And and some of the healing modalities for the body, I, I wasn't, that didn't fit into what I thought I would experience in the death experience. So I have a question that I can't believe I've never asked anyone before. And it's, I'm kind of jumping the gun, but I don't want to forget it. So I'm going to ask you now <laughs> and then we can go back to the stuff. Go ahead and ask your question. And then before you answer, Alyssa, we're going to take a break. But then okay. we leave that question hanging so people come back. Let's hang her. Yes. Wow. Good work, Terry. Okay. So you had this experience where you died, whether it was a few minutes or 20 minutes, you know, you're not 100% sure. But after everything that happened and coming back now today, how do you feel about death? Are you afraid to die at all? Or is it just like, yeah. It's such a great way to leave them hanging. So wait, <laughs> we're going to take a break. But when we come back, we're going to get the answer to that question. And we're also going to find out what lessons Alyssa brought back with her because she learned a lot on these downloads and she is going to share them with us right after this break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Skeptic Metaphysicians. We are talking to Alyssa Rushton, who died and came back with all the answers. And we are lucky to have her with us because we've always wanted to know all the answers and we now can get the chance to know them. (laughs) Before we went on break, Karen, you asked a wonderful question to Alyssa and I so meanly didn't let her answer. You left us all hanging. Yeah. The question was regarding fear of death, right, Karen? Mm -hmm. Yep. After having this experience and everything that you went through, how do you feel about death now? Are you afraid or do you welcome it? Well, let me answer the question this way. I don't actually think you can die before it's your time. So if it's Mm. not really your time, I actually don't think you can. I think you'll either come back or you'll, you know, you'll struggle in the death process to not die. (laughs) Um, So I don't, I don't think you can die before it's your time, which is kind of a great feeling to have, especially if you're somebody who has a lot of fear and anxiety about it. Mm -hmm. Um, I will also say that the dying process is something I wish we taught in the West differently because it's actually not dying. It's actually a birth into more consciousness than you ever have. I I kind of uh, make the analogy of it's like trading in your Ford for a jet plane. Oh, Ooh, I like that. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to be sad when you trade in your Ford 
You're going to hand over your keys and be like, well, I'm glad I don't have to smell that funky smell. Let's bend them back anymore. Let's <laughs> them not that forward. there's anything wrong with those that drive Fords. That's, <laughs> <laughs> this episode is not brought to you by Ford. <laughs> right. But you're going to be happy. It's not, it, you know, you're going to not get that stink out. The seats are going to work a little bit better because you probably had her for a long time. The seats aren't working so well and it maybe it's a little dense on the outside. So when you pass on, you just release the physical body. You don't release your consciousness and your soul lesson. Your consciousness goes with you. And I think that's the biggest, you know, non-teaching that we do. And I also want to say one of the things we don't teach here in the West that I believe that we should start is that where your thoughts are focused when you pass has a lot to do with where you go. And it, it really can be a conscious process of growth and evolution. But if you're not conscious, like I was not conscious, I went to a non-conscious place. I got to experience a, a lot of amazing growth. And I was like, you didn't pass the test. You get to go back to the little holding place in order to reboot myself back into the earth experience again, because I didn't pass third grade, which by the way, we are here on third grade. This is planet third grade, you know? 3D mm -hmm. makes perfect sense. Right. Yeah. We're learning, Absolutely. we're learning base lessons that at higher levels of consciousness, you're not learning these lessons. You're not learning how to not kill each other. You're not learning how to, you know, trust your intuition. You've already learned those lessons, but we've got to learn these lessons here. And it's just like they don't let you drive the fighter jet, you know, the big uh fast jet until you've learned how to pass flight school and 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 learned how to not drive your Ford anymore, right? So we mm -hmm. have to learn certain behaviors and ways of being before we can move on. And if we don't uh, move on, if we don't direct our consciousness, if we're not that conscious when we pass, we just loop back and we do another tour at third grade. That is my experience that I saw happen mm, on okay. the other side. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. So. so then when you came back, you came back with, you mentioned you had a lot of downloads when you're up there mm -hmm. and we kind of teased it a little bit. So I'd love to tap into it just a little bit. Now you came back with some lessons, some secrets mm -hmm. that you really want to make sure that everyone who hears this gets. So mm -hmm. can you share some of those with us? Yeah. So, you know, and I'm, I'm not sure even where to start. <laughs> you know, mm. one of the things when I came back, I came back to a broken body. I came back with all these downloads and all these insights, but a very broken body that took me years to repair. This transition from me being 240 pounds to now me being, you know, no medication, feeling very healthy, feeling very fit, having tons of energy, that did not happen overnight. So... Part of the process of learning that I um, had to go through and bringing through those learnings on the other side um, was that we truly can create any experience that we want for ourselves here. And at the same time, we've got to release a lot of that stuff that is our trauma. You know, one of the biggest things that, you know, finally now people are starting to talk about is we come into the planet with trauma embedded in our DNA. So you could come into the planet, be born as a baby, and nothing happened to you ever. But the very fact that your DNA holds trauma from the last, well, we can see in epigenetics, it holds trauma mm -hmm. from seven generations. My experience on the other side is it holds all of the lifetimes of trauma. And mm -hmm. so it's our, it's, I want to say it's our responsibility as a human here in this lifetime to start to heal through the trauma and to stop repeating some of the patterns and cycles and really do things differently. So that's really the number one thing is really attending to the trauma that we're holding on the inside of ourselves in working through it in the modality that I was given on the other side is a multidimensional modality. So it involves all four of your body systems. So we tend to think of the body as just the flesh suit, right? It's just my flesh suit, but it's your physical body. Then you have your mental body, which is just a little 
part of outside of your system. Then you have your emotional body. And um, the Institute HeartMath has researched this and, and has found that we can measure it about eight feet around your body. But my experience is as human <clears throat> beings, we can feel somebody's emotional state huh. far beyond that, right? We can, you can mm-hmm. feel someone coming down the street. They're 100 yards away from you. And you know, <laughs> I probably need to cross the street right now. You know, you can feel mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Now, is that, is that the aura? Is that what you talk about is the aura? Or is that something different? Well, these are part that inform the aura. So physical ah. body informs the aura, mental body informs the aura, emotional body informs the aura, and does your spiritual body. That all informs their layers of the aura, if you will. Okay. So you're projecting out all of this energetic around you. And so the modality that I teach is to work with those four bodies versus just one or the other. Like a lot of energy healers will just work with the spiritual body. Or a lot of trauma healers will work with the emotional body. Um, a lot of doctors only work with the physical body. But if you can imagine, you're missing. It's kind of like, well, something's wrong with your heart, but we're only going to deal with your heart, not the rest of you. It's mm-hmm. a compartmentalized approach. So we're really working with more of the body. So that was kind of the first piece that we have to start as human beings to excavate and clear this trauma that's embedded within us that causes us to do things not from the soul level. Because for the last 6,000 years, we've been under the operational program of me, my stuff, how much can I get? How much can I own? How many people can I buy? I mean, literally, those are some of the pro, they're dark programs. Like, how can I get ahead by using these folks over here? Or it doesn't matter how many people I have to kill if I get my land and I'm cool. I just wanted my land. You know, these are some of the things that Mm -hmm. as a, a race of human beings, we've been operating under the egoic structure of that and following that success right? Mm. Success is, oh, I made, you know, $5 million this year, but I screwed over 10,000 people, right? Yeah. Or, oh, yeah. we, you know, Coca-Cola, like we made uh, $4 billion this year, but we're, we're poisoning people with chemicals. And oh, by the way, we create some of the most plastic waste on the planet, right? And that's no longer considered success. We are getting towards a time when we're transitioning towards soul success and understanding, and more and more people are understanding that it's not just this lifetime, that our soul is here to grow and that it doesn't really matter um, the things. And here's one of the biggest learnings. And by the way, this is not new information, but you don't get to take anything with you to the other side. You don't get to take the money. You don't get to take the clothes. You don't get to take the cars. And by the way, you don't care about any of that stuff over there. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And that's the most important part, right? That you you, you don't miss it. You don't, Mm -hmm. like, it's not, you, you transcend everything that's physical in the world. The one question that jumped to mind, and I forgot to ask it in the first part of this interview, but I got to ask it now because it, it struck me again. When you crossed over, did you feel, like this was something that was forever? That was how we are going to live from now on, Miss Rushton? Or is this something that could it have been a transitional period? My sense was that you really do get to pick where you want to go off to next if you pass certain curriculum. Just like, you know, when you're, you graduate high school, And then you meet with your college advisor and they're like, what classes do you want to take this year? And you say, Mm -hmm. oh, I want to take these classes. And I'm like, okay, great. So my sense was there's all these other amazing, interesting places to go and see and experience. And so we sort of get a pit stop to review the life, to make sure we pass the lessons, to make sure we're ready to move on, to get our bearings about us and then choose that next destination that the soul wants to experience and grow from. Because that's my experience over there is really is about expanding consciousness and growing the consciousness through experience. Mm, okay. So getting back to the, the lessons that you learned, you talked about the healing modalities that you were able to work on all four of the bodies. Systems. Yeah. Uh, yeah thank you. Mm. 
is it, and I know you're a sound healer and things. So how do you work on all four at the same time? I mean, obviously you got to work out, you got to eat right, right? You got to go to a shrink. Like what, what kind of (laughs) things do you suggest people do in order to get their stuff aligned? Yes. Great question. So let's talk about sound frequency for a second. So yes, please. one of the biggest things they show me up there is sound informs sacred geometry. Sacred geometry informs physical matter. So mm-hmm. the sounds, if you think about it this way, the sounds you're listening to are informing your physical matter, your physical body, and that we can heal the physical body and literally rearrange what's in the body and rearrange the cells um, by informing it through sound. Now, on the other side, I didn't know. I mean, I, I understood and I saw all of that. But when I came back in my Alyssa body, it made sense to me, but I didn't have the practical knowledge to understand if there was research around this or anything like that. So for you guys, I want to tell the viewers, too, that there is a study of cymatics, which is how sound affects physical form. And you can literally watch a sand table, so a table with sand on it that's hooked up to frequency, and you could watch that sand make beautiful, intricate patterns, or you could watch that sand act like an angry crowd of people by Mm. the frequency that is put into it. And so for us as humans, and one of the first things I started to do to heal my body was work with sound and bring in frequencies that are known for healing and helping the cells come back into homeostasis, help those cells to release toxins, help our physical body start to entrain to something differently. Because if you think about even the TVs that we watch and the things that we listen to, that's informing the cells. They don't call it programming for nothing, right? TV programming, mm, right? Uh, right? It, it is actually right. programming your physical body on some level is programming your mind, but also the cells in your body. And you can watch this too at, at work by you watch a commercial for a hamburger and maybe you don't even like hamburgers, but you're watching the commercial and your mouth will start to salivate because the sound and the visuals are working on your physical body, making your cells produce chemicals and hormones. So one of the most powerful things that people can do and you can do if you're healing from something right now is go into sounds that are harmonizing for you. That might be bird songs. That might be being in nature and just letting the frequency come through. One of the things that I got to see on the other side was that we are so disconnected from Mama Earth, which is a natural healing frequency for humans. And you know, I will ask people, when's the last time you went barefoot for more than 10 minutes or laid on the ground? And most people will tell me, I can't remember the last time. I mean, mm-hmm. the ants and the spiders and the snakes and stuff, you know. <laughs> totally. Now, do you have to be able to hear the sounds for it to work? Because I'm thinking about deaf people. And how does so, that work for them? That's a great question. So your body's always listening. And just because something's outside of our audible auditory range does not mean it doesn't work. So for deaf people, they can still feel, their body can still feel the frequency. In fact, I use Mm -hmm. a frequency device where you cannot hear the sound, but your Mm -hmm. body can feel the frequency. So it is beneficial if you can hear, but if you don't have hearing or you don't have um, the range to hear some of the tones, it's okay. You would put, um, you could put headphones on your body and pump the sound into your body. You know, the earth is making a sound. We just can't hear it. We, we don't mm-hmm. hear at that low range. Um, and there's sounds that come on off the earth that's so high that we can't see and, and hear. Um, so we have to start thinking outside of the bounds of the five senses. Mm-hmm. And that's another one of the lessons. As humans, we're taught in the five senses. We're not trained in the discipline of being multisensory. We're not trained in the discipline of being able to expand out past the, the five senses, but they're there. And what I have seen is that you can actually train this. It is a skill. And just like anything, you can hone into it. But it does require practice, just like reading. 
is a skill. It requires teaching, someone to teach you what the words equal this and here's the practice. One of the things I do in the Energy Healers Academy is I teach remote viewing. So I teach people how to actually look at things that are outside of their knowledge base and see and feel what's there and become quite accurate at it. So it is a skill like anything. We just don't teach it, especially in the West. So Mm -hmm. part of my work is to open up some of these teachings and help people become multi-sensory, dimensional, multi-dimensional beings because we actually have access to it. Wow. I want to be a multi-sensory I want to take your classes. I know. (laughs) If you're not watching this, just I'm thinking about what you said in your body being elastic and you move so much when you talk. But it's not like some people are like doing all kinds of crazy stuff with you. It's just it like it works. It's I like, like a, that. It's like a dance, right? It's like she, she, her, her way of expressing is dance. Yeah. It's very fluid. It's, very, I mean, it, it's really beautiful. Very captivating. Now, this is a question. If, if we're being programmed audibly by the sounds that we're listening to or even subconsciously hearing, how much does sounds that go against our vibrational frequencies, how much does it affect us? And- if I listen to heavenly music and birds for an hour and I go back and I listen to the news for five, how bad is that for me, for example? That's a great question. You know, oh, we're three for three, baby. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm asking them. You know, I think, I think it's probably individual for everybody because everybody's ultimately everybody's body is different and everybody's body oh. can tolerate something different. And okay. that said, I personally think the more you can do of something beneficial, the better. And the less you can do of something that is harmful to your system, the better. And so I'm not a a fan of saying don't watch the news at all. Don't, you know, don't not do certain things, but maybe don't watch it for five hours. Right. Right. Um, I'm not saying don't sit outside and listen to the jackhammer. You because sometimes we have to tolerate noises that are disharmonious to our bodies. But that's the jackhammer is one that everybody gets. Nobody really wants to opt in for sitting near a jackhammer. (laughs) (laughs) Right. No, thank you. (laughs) Totally. And you and why is that? Because you already know it's going to suck. Right. You know, Uh you're going to feel awful. Yeah. Big time. Because. Things like the news, you know, there's pleasing to the eye people and it feels like it's information that we can we can start to listen to that stuff longer. And even certain music, it it can disharmonize us or harmonize us. And so one of the biggest things that um, I'm hopeful to help people learn is to listen to our body because the body is such a channel of energy. And ultimately, we're here on Earth. Everything has to come in and through the body. You know, it stops and ends with the body. So if you are having an experience in your life that you don't like, if you're having something that's not healing or something that feels intractable or something, you know, you have a relationship that's not going well, you can start to harmonize your body and start to work with the energy that's inside Because I also understood up there that if you can imagine the outside circumstances of your life all come from the projector in your heart, okay? And so we all have this like projector in our heart mind that is infused with trauma and beliefs and all these things. And you hear a lot of attraction teachers um, say, by the way, I think this is one of the biggest um, unfortunate things that people talk about that's not true they'll say you would like attracts like and um you know if you just vibrate high enough have you heard this if you just vibrate high enough constantly yeah Mm -hmm. 135 episodes in i think everybody that's been on has said it except for you now i would say the exact opposite you can have the most yes you can have the most high flying frequency vibration of all times but if you have beliefs and traumas those are what are projecting out. Those are what is out there happening gotcha. in the world. And that is why you have these people with incredibly high vibrations and they're poor and they're broke and their lives are not working. Or, yeah. you know what I'm saying? It's because yeah. you don't attract your vibration, you attract what you believe. 
Right. So that and that's kind of how I see it. Is that you? Whatever your your emotions are, what triggers the attraction. We just re- very recently released something about gratefulness. That yeah. how important it is to be grateful. You can't just say, "Oh, I'm thankful for this." You got to really feel it, right? You got to feel that gratefulness. Otherwise, you're not aligning yourself with that frequency. But you take it even further than that. Yeah, because you can have all these feelings of gratitude and. And blessings and your life can be working. But if you have the belief that nobody likes me, um, you won't have any friends and you'll be alone. You'll be a super grateful oh. alone person, you know? Well, well some, <laughs> some people might be grateful not to have these dumb people around all the time. <laughs> That's also true, right? But at the end of the day, it's you're, you're projecting always outward. And so... Therefore, if we can start to take a look at and help ourselves align with our own sound frequency and our breath and start to move, pull throughout some of these traumas out of our body, which, by the way, breath is one of the best ways to pull out embedded, you know, CPTSD, childhood post-traumatic stress trauma disorders, which most everybody has. But the breath is such a great way to pull it up and out of the body. And ultimately, we keep dragging around the same experiences again and again and creating the same experiences as humans again and again because we haven't yet processed out the emotion that's embedded in the DNA and inside the cell and inside the uh, mitochondria. And ultimately, that's part of what we're doing is trying to purge all this stuff out. If that makes any sense at all. It do- Yeah, because then your emotion triggers a reaction and a reaction triggers a thought and a thought affects your energy and yeah, it's and whoo. biochemistry and all of it. Yeah. All right. And the thigh bone connects you to the <laughs> bone. Uh-huh. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I feel like we're literally just scratching the surface. This is yeah. stuff that you help others to come to grips with, right? This is this is your bailiwick. You but we talked a little bit about sound healing and talked a little bit about remote viewing. You've talked a little bit about breath work. When someone comes to you, what should they expect? How are you going to help them? Wait, one second. Bailiwick? Did I say Bailiwick? Did you say Bailiwick? Am I that old that I said Bailiwick? <laughs> oh, no. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, what? Okay. Wow. I'm sorry. I just had to point that out. No, I, I appreciate you pointing out <laughs> my old fashioned. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. I don't either. Well, but I'm really right. glad you called me out on it. I think we're channeling an older <laughs> gentleman. Well, you know, I do, that question. I do have my selenite, so maybe that could, yeah, could be the maybe. case. Always blame selenite. it on the selenite. That's what well, I know. Of course. Always. So, whippersnapper, what's your bailiwick <laughs> there? Uh? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> back to the question, Alyssa. How, how, what can someone expect when they come see you? As a great question, miracles is usually the answer. So I I love that. Find me up. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I believe in miracles are possible for people. And and typically, you know, the the individual has that you think you have your life stream, but really what you have is you have a life stream with infinite possibilities. And most people are operating. Uh, If you were to put a scale, they're operating at about 25% of their maximum life stream possibilities. Mm. So most people, even if they're a a high-level person and are amazing and doing good work in the world, they have access to all of these infinite possibilities that they might see but don't believe are possible or they might feel but don't know how to get there. And so technically what I do uh, is not me at all. I first have to say, (laughs) (laughs) all that's happening is I'm helping that person access a hundred percent of their soul's energy. I'm not healing them. I'm not doing it for them. I'm helping them access their soul's energy, their highest life plan and getting a physical feeling of what that is in their body and aligning soul's will with divine or universal will along with the heart and bodies will. And once you get those three things lined up, a lot of things start clicking and taking better. But then when that starts to happen and you're bringing more of the soul's energy in, the personality structure starts to release some of the things that it thought were important and some of the ways that it was using as coping mechanisms. So let me give you an example of this. Somebody comes in, they're an alpha male, and they kind of tend to dominate. 
people and feel like they need to control things in order to get their needs met. Okay. And so if we were to start working together, we help them get aligned with their soul. And when the soul starts running the energy, the person all of a sudden was like, I don't need to control everything. I don't need to be an alpha male. I don't need to prove to everybody that I'm right. In fact, I don't care if anybody ever thinks I'm right ever again in any conversation. Such a powerful way to feel, to be, actually. Yeah. yeah. Right? I just had this image of a, of a ship, you know, anchored out and just cutting the anchors because you feel like they're keeping you in a safe place. But what you don't realize is these anchors are so big, they're actually sinking the boat. Brilliantly stated. Yes. Look at you, man. <laughs> the blam. Yeah. <laughs> they know that. Yeah. And that's what happens. And so all that I do is help people access that frequency and help them get a palpable feeling of it. And then once they know how to run their own soul's energy, then, you know, we can start to unpack some of those personality constructs that have kept them safe, have put together the beliefs that are not working for them, that maybe the belief is like, I I can make a lot of money, but I have to work myself really hard and I have to work all night long in order to make this money. Guilty. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's a really common one, right? And so Mm -hmm. when we start to unpack those beliefs and work through the layers of that, then all of a sudden they're making more money and having to work less time and having more ease in their life in order to move up these higher possibility timelines. And they can bring versions of themselves through that they didn't know were really available or instantly align with healthier, happier versions of themselves. And I call this working with timelines, but that's ultimately what we're doing in a nutshell is aligning the soul with the being and moving more of their higher timeline energy through. Do you have a friends and family discount? Because I'm in. (laughs) That (laughs) sounds great. Well, it's really, you know, it's really cool. A very common experience I will tell you for my clients is that they will double or triple whatever income that they're making pretty much straight away, usually within the month. Um, it's a wow. super common occurs because it's not because of me. It's nothing that I'm doing. It's because they're able to release the limitations and align themselves with what's already there. So on the other side, and here's one of the biggest things that's really important for you and your listeners to know is that all possibilities are already there. All it's kind of like, have you ever read a book? The yeah. book? Yeah. <laughs> As a matter of fact. Yeah. As a matter of fact, you there are. You go bragging again, Will. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when you read this book, <laughs> you didn't have to wait on page two for page 72 to be written, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Right. Yep. It True. was already there for you. 72 was already there. Uh, when you bought the book, all the pages were there. Yes. It, and that's And that's how we are? That's how the life is. All the possibilities are already there for you. They're all there. And what's important is for you to release the limiting beliefs off so that you can pop up to the potentials that are already in the field for you. So you could turn the page and get to page 72. Yeah. Without, here's the secret without having to turn the page and turn the page, like move from two to three to four oh, to five so to six to seven. Through the book. You can just flip to page 72. Oh God, I love that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. We are so stupidly short on time, but I have to ask because this is this is fascinating stuff. What kind of miracles have you seen happen when they work with you? I know you, you mentioned like doubling and tripling your money right there, right by itself. I'm there. I'm all about it. But we know that you've seen some other miracles that have come about because of the work that you've done with people. Can you share some of those with us? Yeah, quick? so I would say it's because of the work that they're allowing to do themselves. Like, I don't get to take sure. credit for this work ever. I really, really don't. It's not mine. It's not me. I just direct traffic. Like, I'm just out there saying, you know, mm-hmm. got my my little <laughs> vest on directing traffic. <laughs> right. <laughs> but don't cut yourself short because you are helping direct that traffic and we, people need that. So That's right. maybe it's a partnership, right? You're partnering up with you. That's right. But it's really mostly their energy that's doing it. But I you mean, are I've way seen... too modest, Alyssa. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I've seen people heal cancers from the, like go from a, a body full of cancer to no cancer. I've seen people with intractable illnesses that just get released and go away. And all of a sudden they don't, 
need it anymore. I've seen, you know, it's it's been mostly body healings, but it can also be stuff like relationship. You know, they were having struggles in a relationship and then they thought they were going to have to leave their person, but then all of a sudden they align. And then all of a sudden their person who was totally in a weird spot all of a sudden aligned themselves and now they have the yummiest, most delicious love affair of all times. You know, so it's it's really relative to what the person is needing, but it typically tends to revolve around love, relationships, health, and money. Right. Um, but what ultimately, about- it's that highest timeline version of the self that the person really longs to experience. The, yeah. We just show them that they can have access to that and that they can get it. What about spiritually? I know I just... <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting too excited here. Right? Uh, what about spiritually? Does it working with you? Does because my my big thing is trying to find my path to me to my higher self. Mm-hmm. Does working with you? Will, can you can you help people get to that point, or is it mostly just physical healings and things like that? Well, that's what creates the physical healing. So when mm. you're right, when you're working with your soul and your higher self and universal energy. If that's your starting point, then the physical body wants to align. Then your finances want to align. Then your relationships want to align. Does that make sense? It's kind of like somebody, Mm -hmm. like I'll use myself as an example. I needed to lose 100 pounds, but that was a side effect. It wasn't the cause. It was the side effect. So when I aligned my life, oh, by the way, I lost 100 pounds almost without doing anything. I mean, really, truly, I didn't have to do a whole lot of work for 100 pounds to fall off. So to your point, when you work at the higher self level, when you work at soul's frequency and make that your purpose and your way, um, then everything else starts to align and flow and grow and the life starts to blossom. I don't know, man. This sounds just way too good to be true. I mean, (laughs) that sounds amazing. Okay. I'm sold. I'm, you, we're gonna, you're gonna hear from me after this for sure. I think Karen and I are both are gonna dive in with our both mm-hmm. our feet because this sounds incredible. Alyssa, I do feel like we're literally just scratching the surface. There's so much that you brought back. There's so much that I know on the show notes that that we were supposed to talk about. We didn't get a chance to. So thank you for coming and sharing just a little nugget of your wisdom with us because it's been fantastic, super it really fascinating. Has. Yeah. Oh, okay. And uh, and hopefully maybe we can we can entice you to come back to continue our conversation because this has been wonderful. I would love to. And I'd love to just invite everybody to know that, you know, that these are things that you can do. I mean, you don't even need me to do it. You can do a couple of YouTube searches. You can start working with sound frequencies. You can start you know, asking your soul to work with you. You can start asking your soul to show you what running the frequency of instantaneous healing looks like. You can start asking your soul, you know, soul, show me what it feels like to run the frequency of infinite abundance and let your soul start to show you how that frequency feels in and through the body because at the end of the day, it starts and ends at the body. Like you have to be able to feel it palpably in your system. So yeah, you can start to do this right now. I love that. However. Even in Hindu culture, you need a guru. You need someone to kind of lead you on the path. So yes, there's a lot of resources out there right now. Unfortunately, there's a lot of resources out there that aren't quite so good and can lead you on the wrong path. So You've never been much of a DIY guy. And I've never been much of a (laughs) DIY guy. So I need someone to hold my hand and take me down the path because I get lost really easy. (laughs) Well, if someone wanted to reach out to you, what's the best way for someone to, to get in contact? Yeah, you can go to Alyssa, only one S in that, AlyssaRushton.com. And, uh, you know, we've got lots of lots of freebies on the website, lots of things to get you started. And then, of course, glasses and all of the goodies there for you, too. Awesome. We're going to add that link as well as a few others in our show notes. All you need to do is go to SkepticMetaphysician.com so you can connect directly with Alyssa. Alyssa, thank you so much for coming on. It's been beautiful talking to you today. Oh, my gosh. Thank you guys for having me. It was so much fun. And a huge thank you to you. Yes, you, the person that hit play on this episode. We know that there are tons of options out there. And having you decide to come along on our journey of discovery with us is an absolute honor for us. We hope you've enjoyed this conversation as much as we have. If you did and you feel called to give back, we invite you to visit our website at skepticmetaphysician.com where you can donate to the show or subscribe as a member through our Buy Me A Coffee campaign. 
Your support will go a long way towards allowing Karen and I to bring you these wonderful conversations and teachings in more and more robust ways. Of course, if contributing to the show content is what you're looking for instead, well, we'd love for you to contribute by sending us a voicemail or an email from our website or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or any other podcasting platform that supports them. Karen and I love hearing from those that are moved to message us. It truly does fuel our passion. You are the reason we do this show. And knowing what you like and don't like help us craft the very best show we can so that we can help raise the vibration of the planet together. Now, if you know someone who would benefit from hearing the message we're sharing on the show, do them and us a favor and share the show with them. It will help get the word out about us and it might just change someone's life for the better. Well, that's all for now. We will see you on the next episode of The Skeptic Metaphysician. Until then, take care.